Take your Bibles out to Revelation chapter 2, verse 12, continuing this series on the church. And that's what it is. It's, it's a series. It's just uh, letters to the church. So we're going one letter to the next, and there's so much to unpack and so much to learn from each one of these. So I'm enjoying this. And uh, it made me think of this. Uh, we were on uh, vacation. We were so excited to go on vacation. So we planned a year ago to go on a cruise. Well, you guys can imagine how that played out for us this year. So we got the notice there was going to be no cruise. It's not going to happen. So uh, we just figured vacation was done for for this year. So we, uh, I, I gave a challenge to my kids. I said, what if we figure out what can we do to make vacation still happen for this year? So we all went on this adventure to try to research which areas are open. So we were looking all over the place. And finally, we figured out Orlando was the biggest area open. Not Disney World, not, not all the parks and stuff like that when we went down there, but uh, Orlando as a city. So we rented a house. It had a little pool in the back. We were all excited about getting away. And I told Jenny and the kids, I said, I want an adventure. I want something that we're going to do that we're going to look back and say that was epic, that was cool, that was still out of the norm. So I'm cheap, so I got on Groupon, and I'm trying to find something in the area uh, that we could get some sort of deal on and things like that. So I came across this picture on Groupon, all right? And I'm thinking, I don't know what that is. Well, I knew that that was a manatee, but I didn't know what the adventure was. And it was kayaking with manatees and dolphins. And of course, this was a hard sell with Jenny. I was trying to convince her to go kayaking with wild animals. And she's like, I don't want to do that with any animal, okay? I'm just, I, I didn't want to do that. So I was, I, I mean, that, that can't be false advertising. I mean, that's how they're advertising this adventure. So I booked this thing. We we're in Orlando. It's in Cocoa Beach. So we had like a two-hour drive to get there, an hour and a half, something like that. I was so pumped. The lady called me back. She said, make sure you go to the right address. You, we, we go and launch from the certain spot. You have to have the address. So she texted me the address. It's at 930. They're departing. We had to get up really early in the morning to get breakfast, get all the way there and stuff like that. So we go on this adventure. We pull into this spot. And I told Jenny, I said, this is the weirdest location. She goes, what, what do you mean? I says, it looks like a condo. This, this doesn't look like anything. I mean, I figured there'd be like a manatee sign out or something, you know, something to say you're at this kayaking place. Nothing. So I got out and I said, well, I'll go find the entrance. So I'm walking around this condo, you know, like looking in the windows and, you know, trying to figure out where's the entrance, how do you get in this place? You know, I'm thinking there should be like an enter here type thing. So have you ever done something, you get a gut feeling like this isn't right, you know? I didn't know if it was from me looking in their windows or if it was just the situation wasn't right. But I, I'm thinking, this is not right. So I get in the car and I said, Jenny, I said, there is nothing here that looks remotely. So I called the lady and I said, we can't get in. She goes, just go through the door. I says, I, it's, it's, it's locked at somebody's house. So she says, are you sure you're at the right location? I read the address that she gave me, that she texted me. She goes, that's our address. But when I read the city, she goes, what, what did you say? And I think it was like Melbourne or something like that. She goes, that's an hour away from us. And I'm like, what? I was so irritated. I was so mad. Jenny can tell you, you say Christians shouldn't be irritated. Pastors definitely should not be irritated. I broke both of those rules on the spot. I was irritated. I was so frustrated because I was telling the lady, I said, I'm only at this location because I followed the address you texted me. I didn't even type it in anything. I just clicked the link and it brought me right to that spot. She said, they are launching the boats in the next 15 minutes. You've missed everything. I prepaid. Uh, we were all excited. Jenny wanted a selfie with a manatee. I was going to make that dream come true. You know, I mean, everything was just going to happen in that spot. I was so excited so I th she said, drive up here. Maybe we can figure out something once you get here. You guys can just go around, the, you know, in the water and just try to find the manatees by yourself. Or whatever. So I'm driving. I'm irritated and going there. Here's the thing. When I was there, I had no idea, no idea how lost I was. I, the whole destination, I wasn't like telling Jenny, do you think we're in the right place? Do you think we got off? Do you think we're, everything's going to be messed up by the time we get there? Do you think this is all going to fall apart? Do you think we're going to lose all our money? Never crossed my mind. I thought everything was okay. I couldn't find the entrance. I couldn't figure out even the right way to go. 
I couldn't even figure out. I said, I don't know how to get to you, lady. I don't know because every time you send me the address, it brings me right to the spot. Something was messed up with Google. It was, we don't even know to this day exactly what happened. I was so irritated. It's actually a biblical principle. The Bible says this idea of being lost, and it's in Corinthians. He said, but, but if our gospel be hid, it's, it's hid to them that are lost. See, I mean, it's, that's the exact description. It's hid to them that are lost. Those that thought, I, I've got this figured out, and I know where I'm going, and I, I think I'm okay. But nothing's working out, and I, I, I can't make this work, and this isn't happening, and this doesn't add up, and I just did what I was, knew to be right. But it's not working. You know how easy it is for Christians to look at the lost and say, what's wrong with you? And why are you acting that way? And why are you in that spot? And why are you doing that? But for them that are lost, what did I do wrong? I'm just, I'm just, trying, to, I'm just, I'm just trying to do my best. I'm just trying to do what's right. I, I don't know how I got there. I don't know what's wrong with this situation. It's frustrating. The Bible talks about if our gospel be hid. Did you see that? You know, a lot of times we associate the gospel with just the Romans road. This is how you get led to Jesus. You realize the gospel is, is it's the Bible. It's the good news. It tells me how to live and what's right and what's wrong and how to stay right and how to stay away from what's wrong. And it tells me how to parent. It tells me how to raise my kids. It tells me how to have a good marriage. It tells me how to find fulfillment in life. It tells me how to deal with fear. It tells me, it tells me life. It's the gospel. But the Bible says this, if it's hid, there's a lot of ways that we can put it. It's not hid like, aha, I'm not going to show this to you. But it's a matter if my life is to be living out the gospel through my marriage and through my attitude and through my morality and through my character. And if I'm not doing that, it's hid to them that are lost. Literally meaning those that are lost are going to look at me going, I'm still lost and I, I don't know how to get out of here and I don't know how to find what's right because I don't see anything different in you from than what's from me. Does that make sense? They're lost. Life is not working. They don't know why. And yet the gospel is the answer. The gospel is truth. Think about it. when Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. When he says, I'm the way, I'll, I'll show you how to go. It's better than GPS. It's, it's directional. It's informational. The church is called to live out the gospel. It's what we do. This, this city that he's writing to in, in this passage was needing the gospel because this city was very, very lost. It says in Revelation chapter 2, verse 12, and to the angel of the church of Pergamos write. Now, we, we've kind of been going through this. It's every church is a different church. And the, the reason why it labels the church is because it, it's very informational. It's description. Like, for instance, today, if I was to say I wrote a letter to a church that was in Columbus, Ohio, you guys would associate OSU and, and football and, you know, uh, our economy and, and the, you know, the good, the bad, all those kind of things with it. You would understand the world that I was trying to reach. But if I said to the church that is in Las Vegas you would think differently and go, oh, wow, they have a whole different set of challenges being a church in Sin City. Or what if I said, I'm writing to the church of Washington, D.C.? You'd be like, oh, that's a lot of politics and, you know, money and all that kind of stuff. What if I said to the church that's in Beverly Hills? So the Bible, when we get there, we learn a lot about the challenges and what's going on from the very city that they're writing to. The city was known for politics. This city was known for false gods, false hope, false religion. If you were to visit this city today, you would find it destroyed, these ruins that were there for all this time. And you're going to find that out of all the cities that we write about or we read about that Jesus wrote to in that time, this city has the most ruins out of all of them that you can kind of go visit and see what's going on. The crazy thing it was built is it had a giant mount in the, in the middle of it, kind of a giant hill. It could be seen from miles around. It had one that was built on top of it. And then all the way around it was all these temples built with false gods. And people would travel from miles around to get to this city 
because they wanted to go to these temples. It's kind of like if you were looking for fun and you're in the world, you would go to Las Vegas to have fun or you go to Disney World to have fun. They knew in order to go to this city, you're going to find something there. You're going to find temples that if I need prosperity or if I need health, if I need these things, I'm going to go to that place, get in that line, go into that temple to get what I need in my life. You know, the sad thing is, it was all lies. You could go in there, pray to that rock, walk out, and not get anything. And they had crazy things that they would do. One of the places for healing, it was known to have like snakes. And if you lay down on the floor and a snake crawled over you, it would be a sign of healing. You say it's twisted, it's messed up. Do you guys realize if this is direction, this is hope, just like me trying to get there, the further society gets away from direction, the more confused society gets. That's how it is. The closer that I am, the more that I understand, oh, that's who I am, and that's how I'm made, and that's what eternity is, and that's what happens if you die, and that's how I get through trouble, and this is how I have answers in life. But the more people get away, and let's just say our society, we're not talking to the church of Pergamos, talking to the people of Ohio, Columbus, Canal Winchester. The further we get away from direction and truth and way, the more culture gets confused. Or can I put it like this, the more they're lost. I, nothing works. I don't know what to do. I talk to my spouse. I yell at my kids to try to do right. I go to work. I feel stressed. I feel fearful. I feel overwhelmed. Nothing works. Jesus was so brokenhearted over this church because of the fact is that he knew the lost condition of that nation, that, of those people. And he knew that he had a church in the midst of this that could be the answer. And he said, verse 12, to the church of uh, Pergamos, write, these things saith he that hath a sharp sword with two edges. I know thy works. Where thou dwellest, even where Satan's seat is. It's, Jesus is being descriptive. And he says this in this passage. He says, Satan's throne is there. You know, think about a throne or Satan's seat is the description of. He says, literally, I know that Satan has set up his kingdom there. Makes sense, all the lies and deception everywhere. In the city itself, it was actually greater than that of the picture of it because in the middle of this city, there was this great hill and at the very top of it was one of those giant temples. That giant temple was so large and at the top of it, no matter where you were at in the city, usually from some poor perspective, you could actually see that temple. When the sun was going up and everything, literally the whole entire city was in the shadow of that darkness or in the shadow of those lies or the shadow of that false religion. Jesus was writing to him. He said, man, I know where you live. Man, I get it. It's tough. It's hard. And you sit there and say, why would you put in the term Satan's seat? Spiritual warfare. For people to get away from the gospel or to get away from the truth, to pull them away and to keep them lost, it's not just being confused, it's being attacked, it's being deceived by Satan. We sit there and just say, man, they're just messed up or they should be in church, or all this other stuff. And God says, do you not see that there's a darker, deeper thing going on than that? They lived in the shadow of Satan's rule. I'm going to tell you guys, Everybody listening online, everybody engaged in the service right now, the world is starving for truth. Starving for answers. Tell me what works. You say in that culture it was so descriptive that they were willing to lay down on the ground and have snakes crawl over them. And you say, that's crazy. Why would crazy people, why would somebody do that? When you're desperate for answers, when you're desperate for something, you'll do just about anything. That's why in our world, if we're not giving truth, we're not saying this works. And by the way, it's not just a matter of shoving a track in their face. It's about living it too so that they can see that it works. They've got to see it, that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. They've got to see it. Then outside of this, they they are truly lost. I say that because it ought to break our hearts, not make us mad. When we see how the world is, and you see all around us, and people that you, and I I say the word world, I mean outside of the church or outside of the gospel. 
If I'm asking the question, why am I here? Who am I? What am I missing in my life? And I'm thinking, man, I have that answer. They had voices in their head, and they were hearing everything but truth. He said, uh, Jesus said at the end of verse 12, he said, These things saith he which have the sharp sword with two edges. Jesus at the beginning of it, he says, let me tell you what I have. I have something that can cut through the lies. Jesus says, I am the authority that is above the one that puts himself on that throne, the shadow of darkness over them. He said, I'm greater, I'm bigger, I'm more powerful. I am the ruler. You don't answer to the darkness, you answer to the king that is over the darkness. We answer the one that snuffed out the darkness. Jesus said, I know how difficult this is. He said in verse 13, I know thy works and where thou dwellest, even where Satan's seat is, and thou holdest fast my name. And hast not denied the faith. Man, they, they were in the middle of persecution. You never denied it. Even in those days where Antipas, my faithful martyr, who was slain among you, where Satan dwelleth, he says, man, you've been faithful to this church. He said, man, you've been different. You've been light. You've been truth in the middle of all this. He mentioned a guy, and it's, it's, his name was Antipas, and this guy that was martyred in front of them. We're not exactly sure. I've heard different writings and stuff of what happened, but the way that the wording is, is something that impacted all of them. Probably it was a public execution of some sort, something torture, something that affected them. And Jesus was saying, man, I know what you've been through. I've seen it. I feel it. God's not, God's not disconnected from our pain. He's not disconnected with what we're dealing with to the point where he says, I'll tell you what he did, how he died, and who he was. He puts us out there. But the whole point is life was all about a choice of how you're going to live, and he's encouraging them to be the light in the darkness because there's so much lies, so many lies in the midst of this. If we bend to the world, we lose our distinction. If we adapt to the world, we lose our lights. Here he goes. You guys ready? Verse 14. But I have a few things against thee, because thou hast there them that hold the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel, to eat things, sacrifice unto idols, and to commit fornication. Yes, there was some standing for God, probably the majority of this church, because he said some of them were doing this. But he said, I've got to be honest. Not everybody's doing right. And God saw something creeping into the church that was extremely dangerous, that was going to hurt them and hurt the witness and hurt the hope that Jesus Christ was there to give them. I want you guys to listen to this, because in the middle of this, Jesus points all the way back to the Old Testament and begins to address a story. Now, this is a story that a lot of you guys know. Can we do like a a, a story time now? Is Is that okay? If we were in junior church, we'd probably pass out snacks at this time and have you sit on the floor. And you guys are getting really excited. You're just hearing that. You're thinking, is he really going to do that? No, you get no snacks, okay? No snacks. <laughs> but I want to bring you back to the Old Testament of the story that Jesus was teaching. He mentioned the doctrine of Balaam. See, the children of Israel were released out of the bondage of Egypt. They were there for 400 years. God rose up Moses and Aaron and them, and they went in and let my people go. Ten plagues that came down on them, release them. God splits the Red Sea. They go into the wilderness. God's hand was upon them. God was dwelling with them. God was their power. Didn't matter what they faced. Perfect illustration is when they, when they were being chased by Pharaoh's army. God brought down fire from heaven, stopped them in their tracks, opened the sea, brought them in there, brought the water back down on top of them, snuffed them out just like that. That was the power of God. It's amazing what God can do through a church or through God's people when the power of God rests upon them. It's amazing no matter how dark it gets or how much they throw at us or how big their kingdom is. I don't care how big the throne is that Satan rises up in the middle of it. Our God is greater than all of those things. There was one king that started playing it smart. His name was Balak. He was the king of the Moabites. The Moabites go all the way back. Their history is very sinful. He calls for Balaam and he says, I know God's people are coming. I know their reputation. I know when they hit us, we're going to be taken out just like that. I'm going to make a deal with you, Balaam. He said, I know you can talk to your God. I know you have this connection. 
Can I, can I take you on as like a profit for hire? You know, I'll, I'll, I'm going to pay you some money, and I just need you to curse them. Just throw a curse on them and stop them. Balaam says to the king, he says, man, there's a problem with that. I don't have anything of my power greater than their power because they serve the one true God. There's nothing that I can do. Well, the king of Balak, he, he's not understanding that. He just understands it's, you know, there's forces and, and whatever activity, and he just wants to pay him. Balaam goes back to his house. Balak sends his servants there and says, all right, the king's very serious about it. They're going to offer you a huge lump sum of money if you do this. And Balaam's like, oh, that's not a bad idea. I like that. <clears throat> he gets on his donkey. He's going to visit the king. The donkey stops. You guys know where I'm going with this, don't you? How many of you know where I'm going with this? All right, raise your hand. All right. All right, so you get to be pulled in on this story. All of a sudden, this donkey begins to talk to Balaam and says, why are you kicking me? The weird thing is, Balaam just talks back to the donkey. I'm going to ask you guys, if a donkey ever starts talking to you, would you just start up a conversation with him? I, I, it just blows my mind that that was the normal thing that would have just happened in this story. So all of a sudden, this donkey is talking to him, and the donkey says, why are you kicking me? Literally, that's the story. you got to go back and read it. It's awesome. The donkey says, why are you kicking me? And Balaam says, because you're not going anywhere. I need you to go forward. And he said, how can I go forward when the angel of God is standing in front of me? And here this is, the angel that can see that. It's sad when a donkey is more in tune with the things of God than the, the, the man of God that was riding on top of him. It's a whole other message for another time. God was standing in his tracks telling him in that spot, what in the world are you doing? Why are you doing this? I've been swayed and sucked into this for money. Why are you doing this? He goes to see the king. Everything that comes out of Balaam's mouth is praising God. Balaam's not even trying to do it. You have to read the story. Numbers 22, 23, 24, 25, all that is awesome. And the king's getting irritated, saying, why do you keep blessing your God up? Dude, I'm here to pay you to have your to curse these people he said dude i told you again that i cannot do it all this dialogue goes back on back and forth and things like that and then finally balaam has this idea he runs to balaam and he says hey i can't curse god i can't curse his people i can't stop them but there is something you can do why don't you take your women take the the best prettiest girls that you have and i want you to bring them in Start flirting with them. And little by little, if you can reach their heart and pull them away from God, God can't bless sin. And if you can get God's people to look towards the other gods in the other direction, that you can bring them down from the inside out. That is the doctrine and the teaching of Balaam. Do you realize in this passage that we're reading this of this story, it wasn't just a story that God was pointing back to. The doctrine of Balaam is in Revelation 2.14, who taught Balak to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel. Think about the reality of what he's saying. He was teaching them how to make them trip and fall. He cannot stop us. Guys, Satan cannot stop us. And it wasn't even Satan doing it. It's what the Christians, the people, the followers of God allowed in their life to trip themselves up. The doctrine of Balaam is what he was building up to. To do this, to eat the things sacrificed on the idols and to commit fornication. So here's what happens. God's writing to this church and here it is. Here's the letter. Dear church, don't compromise. Dear church, compromise begins when you begin to flirt with sin. I, I, I'm going to put it like this because I... I I've wondered, it's, it says in this passage, it says, who taught Balak to cast a stumbling block. He just, he just put it out in front of them. Just, just throw it out there like a fisherman fishing and putting it out there. Just put it out there. Just right in there. I, I, had a, I don't know how it was, okay? But I know that somehow they've gathered these girls together and said, what do you want us to do? You want us to go over there to the enemy? Yes. I know this is going to sound weird. What do you want us to do? I just want you to flirt with them. I want you to get their eyes and their attention off of their God and put it back on our end. And so that's what they began to do. Actually, in Numbers 25, the Bible says, And Israel abode in Shittim, and the people began. Look at the, the wording of that. And the people began. All of a sudden, there was a transition, a slow transition. Something clicked in their heart. Something clicked in their mind. Something turned their direction. 
the people began to sin. The people began to look in the other direction. I, I'm, not, I'm not there, but I know our culture. I know what it's like. For people that are following God to say, man, what are those girls doing here? Man, they, they're really pretty. Man, I had no idea the women of Moab were, were that pretty. Well, dude, you know we're not supposed to be with. Do you know what? They, they sacrifice the false gods. They, they have false temples. They don't worship. Our, I, know, I know what you're saying, dude, but man, check them out. I'm going to talk to her. What are you doing? I'm just going to talk to her. I didn't say that I'm forsaking my God. Get off my back. I just want to talk to her. Man, are you, are you not wanting to talk to pretty girls? Are you going to, you know, what's wrong with you? Yeah, it, it, there, there was something that began there at the beginning to get their attention to look in the other direction. See, nobody ever says, I'm going to forsake God and bring sin into my family and destroy everything. Nobody ever says, I want to ruin my marriage. Nobody ever just says that I want to become the worst dad ever. Satan just has to grab your attention. Entertain your mind. You, you don't believe me? Just go, just go to David and Bathsheba and ask David how it started. And he saw a woman bathing on the top of the rooftop. Satan knows how to get our attention. Satan knew. And you say, what, what, Satan, why are you blaming this on Satan? Now remember, what do I have to do? And he's warning them on, on top of this, whose, whose kingdom... The work of Satan, all that that he's saying here. Their goal was to grab their attention, to bring them now, not to have a little fun. There's a danger when Christians have this mindset that God draws lines of what's right and wrong because he's trying to keep us from what's fun. You guys hear me? God doesn't try to starve us and bring us away from just what's fun. God knows what's best for us. God created us. God created you. God knows what makes it you happy. God knows what's good for your life. He knows what works. Man, I wish maybe that's how we should have said it at the beginning. If we hide what works from them that are lost, they'll never be able to make anything work. How is that? If we hide the gospel, the good news, I'm going to tell you guys right now, and every young person, everybody's here, God's word works. It works. You say, how does it work? Because it works in marriage because God created marriage. And it works in your sexual identity because God created you who he wanted you to be. And God makes no mistakes. He makes no mistakes. And any time you get confused on it because you've gotten away from what is right, and all of a sudden you're just thinking, I don't know, I don't know. And just like me with that GPS, I was confident when I got there. I was so confident that I know I'm in the right place and I was not in the right place because I had the wrong voice telling me where to go. We have, a, we have a culture today that is so lost and so confused and so frustrated. And maybe in that moment they're thinking, this feels right. This seems right. But eventually nothing works. It doesn't add up. It just it doesn't come together. And they're so frustrated. He said, why are you saying this to the church? We're all sitting here with our Bibles open. You got to understand, they were also talking to God's people that knew right from wrong, that were following the God that brought them through the wilderness, that brought them through the manna, that brought them through everything. They knew right from wrong. They just began to flirt with sin. You see, when you start begin this flirt with sin, small compromises lead to major changes. Small compromises lead to major changes. You don't just get off overnight. All it is is he that knoweth to do good and doeth it not to him it is sin. It's just one step. It always begins with just one step. I know I shouldn't look at this kind of material, but it's just one. I, I know I shouldn't. I, I can't cheat on my spouse, but I'm just talking to this girl because she understands me. I, I know I shouldn't live immorally or I need to live purely. And God says about not having premarital sex. I know what the Bible says, but we're just messing around and we know where to draw the line. It's just one step. You guys remember, every failure begins with just one step. Every decision is going to lead you to something. It will always have an effect on you. Verse 25 again of Numbers, and Israel abode in Shittim, and the people began to commit whoredom with the daughters of Moab. Step two, 
Verse 2. And they called the people to sacrifice of their gods. And the people did eat and bowed down to their gods. See, dear church, compromise begins when you begin to flirt with sin, but it never stops there. Number two, compromise happens when you try to mix the things of God with the things of the world. Nobody ever gets off. No, no dad ever comes home and says, here's the thing. I'm not following God anymore. I'm not going to church. I'm not reading my Bible. No, the, the truth of the matter is for, for the majority of us, man, I love God. I know what's right. I believe the word of God. I want to do what's right. I want to lead my kids to do what's right. I'm going to go to church because I love God and I love church and I love the word of God and I love what it does in my life. But then Friday comes. I'm going to church on Sunday, but it, there's just some things that I want to do. I, I want to live a little and I want to have a little fun and I, I don't understand where all the rules are and, and, and it never hurt anybody. See, it says they, in, in Revelation 2.14, they began to eat the things sacrificed on idols. And I didn't understand what that was. I mean, what, what, what were they doing? They began to go to the party of the false gods. They began to go to the false gods' temples. They began to walk into their surroundings. They were walking out of God's people and walking out of God's worship. And they were going to their Friday night, Saturday night, whatever it was, their things. To socialize, to enter to engage in what they had to offer. But they would still go back. See, the idea is it led them to commit fornication. The idea is to engage in their sin. Isn't it amazing the things that you thought you would never do that you end up doing? Isn't it amazing some of the things that we do as adults now that we used to tell our kids not to do? You used to tell your kids, that's not right, you shouldn't be doing that. And then they walk in, Dad, why are you doing that? Why are you saying that? Why did you get mad like that? Mom, why is it okay for you to get mad? Why is it okay for you to get bitter? Why is it okay for you to gossip? Why is it okay for you to do these things? It's easy to do because we're, we're still want to be Christians, but it's a matter of we begin to mix these things. They began to mix these things with what was wrong with what was right. They would go from worship of their God to the party with the false gods. That's literally the description that's happening here. James 4.4 4 describes it like this. Think of this verse. The first words right here, you're adulterers and adulteresses. I don't think I have to explain to anybody what context we're talking here. Cheating. Sexual immorality. You're crawling in bed with something you should not be crawling in bed with. You know why? Because we are the bride of Christ. Set apart. Different. He says when he comes back that we're clothed in white linen, where we're supposed to be pure and live differently. He said, hey, let me tell you. He said, whoa, 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 whoa. Why would, why would God talk to us like that? Know you not that your friendship of the world, false gods, false religion, anything outside of God is enmity with God. Try this in your relationship at home. Just, just say, honey, I can't come home tonight. I'm going to go by my girl's friend's house, but I'll be home Saturday. You say, would that work? You say, no, that would never work. Do you understand when God says you're my people, you live my way for my, you're good. Remember, let's go back. God's way works. It works. There's no other way. You get out of it. And God's not saying because I want to rob you of all the fun. God's saying it because the other way doesn't work. It doesn't work. Whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is an enemy of God. That is literally what's happening in this passage. They didn't renounce their God. They just wanted both. Just, I just want to mix the two together. See, the thing is, they don't mix. You can't mix righteousness with unrighteousness. You can't be light in darkness. You can't. And the only description that we have in the Bible says, well, somebody take a light and put it under a bushel. You guys know that description when he was talking about. It's a matter, I want to live for Jesus, but I want to do my own thing too. But what happens when you do your own thing? Nobody can see the light. And I don't mean to make it just about your witness, just saying, oh, it's all about leading people to Jesus. It goes deeper than that. It's not just about that. It's about your relationship with God, too. It's about the fact that God's broken for you because of the fact is the way that you're living or the way that you're thinking or the things you're bringing in your life do not work. You see, compromise equals being a hypocrite. Because when you're sitting there, you can imagine, just put yourself in their shoes, put yourself in their their thing. They're sitting there. They worship the one true God. That is the answer. They're partying in that temple. They're living it up, eating the sacrifices to them. 
sleeping with them, doing all this stuff. And then they sit there and say, our God is the one true God. Uh, then why are you over here? Why are you doing the same things we're doing, bowing to our gods, if you are over there doing, telling me that that is the way, the truth, and the life? We lose our distinction. It's not just in the world. It happens in our homes. When we sit there and try to tell our kids or tell our families what is right, and we're not doing right, they're like, wait a minute. How, how can you talk out of both sides of your mouth? Because a double-sided, a double-minded man is unstable in all of his ways. It does not work. So where does this lead? Numbers chapter 25, verse 2, and they call the people unto the sacrifice of their gods, and the people did eat and bow down to their gods. So why is that a big deal? Do you guys realize that that was the goal from the very beginning? See, here it is. Compromise always leads to defeat. Compromise always leads to defeat. See, if you're bowing to the enemy, you have to turn your back on God. And I'm not saying renounce your faith and things like that. I'm just literally saying, in order for me to live it up and party and drink or whatever it is, in order for me to have a filthy mouth, in order for me to have my heart filled with bitterness, in order for me to not forgive those that God's called me to forgive, in order for not to be a peacemaker, and if I'm living over here with bitterness and anger and wrath and malice and all these things coming out of my life, you can't be both. The Bible says, no man can serve two masters. Either he will love the one and hate the other, but you can't straddle a fence. You can't have it both ways. But the reason why Satan was pushing for this, you've got to understand, he said, whose seat was, it was the kingdom of trying to bring them down, was for this. I didn't read this before, but let me read it down. Numbers 22, when Balak came to Balaam and said, this is what I want to happen. He says, come now, therefore, I pray thee, curse me this people. For they are too mighty for me. Peradventure I shall prevail. That we might smite them. That I might drive them out of the land. I say all it was was a little compromise. All it was was a little fun. All we did was want to flirt with those girls. All we did was want to cross the line. Why is there so many rules? And God says you've completely lost it. It, wasn't, it was never about all of just that stuff. It was about them leading you from the power of God. It was about leading you away from truth. It was about their loss, and now you're lost with them. It's a danger. Satan's goal in all of our lives, it wasn't just for dads to have a little fun and teens to live it up. It was always to bring you down. And a lot of times you're in that place and you don't even see it. They were bowing to things in their life that had no power. Do we bow to things that will never, ever give you peace and satisfaction? We can bow to porn and it will never satisfy. You can bow to drugs, it will never satisfy. You can bow to gossip, it will never satisfy. You can bow to flirting with somebody online, it will never satisfy. It will never, ever, ever, ever fix what's missing in your life. Teens can go out and Date, singles can go out and date and you can sit there and crawl in bed with whoever you want and live however you want and sit there and say, well, my mom and dad are so strict and they're so old-fashioned and they're, they're against all this stuff. And you got to understand, it's not a matter of trying to rob you from something or rob thing, good things. Or it's about keeping you from what is wrong that will destroy you. And anybody that's been through some stuff will tell you with all of their heart, if I could tell you the scars and the baggage and the regret... God is a great father that wants good for us. You see, how do, how do we fix this? How, how, how do we do this? L let me ask you this question. In what area of your life have you compromised? In what area of your life have you begun to flirt with sin? I'm not saying you jumped off the end. I'm not saying that you ran to the false temples and you're bound. No, I'm just asking just, just one decision, one step at a time. That's what the doctrine was that they did. Lying, bitterness, lust, purity. Are you slipping? So how do we fix this? Let me end with this, just this challenge, correcting compromise. Jesus says unto them in verse 16, Repent, or else I will come unto thee quickly, and I will fight against thee, or fight against him with the sword of my mouth. He said, I am 
not going to let this happen. God corrects. God loves us. God, God doesn't want us to fall into sin. God doesn't want us to be robbed of the blessings that he has for us in our lives. So here it is. Dear church, here's the one bringing the authority, the one that loves you, brings this to us. Number one, we have to call out compromise. Only you can do this. Now I'm preaching. I'm sharing the word of God. God's writing to this church, this church that's, you know, in revelation of him trying to help us with this. But I'm telling you this, God literally says the idea of repent. The very first word that he says, you know what the word repent is? You say, it's a change of direction. We've already went through this. Repent means more of that. It's got to hit your mind before it can hit your feet. You understand that? You can say, you need to change of direction. You need to stop going down that path. But it's got to hit your mind before it can ever hit your direction. See, you're the only one that knows that you have to turn the channel. You're the only one that knows that you have to change your language. You're the one that has to cut off that relationship. You're the one that has to put your foot down of, uh, of the way that you're dating, the way that you're interacting, or whatever it is. Whatever the sin is that's had in your life, you have to say, God, this is wrong. And I see it. And I know it. Repent. So go the other way. The second thing that he says is to make it right. You see, we make it so much about rules and regulations. Verse 15, God reveals his heart. He, he talks about the doctrine of Balaam, but he also talks about the doctrine of the, the, uh, the Nicolaitans. And he says that also of them. He says, I hate. This is Jesus talking to us. Not often do we have that blatant, language of our God saying to us. He says, literally, what you're doing, I hate it. I hate it. See, for me as a dad, I get that. Because the idea, of, if, if I see my kids getting into something, and I know that they're on a path of compromise, and they're getting off something, and I know where it's going to lead, I hate it. I'm sitting there saying, like, Dad, just get off my back. And Dad, you don't get, no, 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 you don't understand. I know where you're going, and I know where that's going to lead, and I hate it. And God says that to every one of us with that thing. is The reason why you to get it right is because it breaks the relationship with God. Get it right with God, not just the people in your life, but the God that you serve. The last thing he says is it's different. It's to embrace the blessings of obedience. Maybe we leave this out too much. He said, verse 17, He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith to the churches. To him that overcometh will I give eat of the hidden manna. And you're sitting there going, man, I don't, I don't register with that at all. I have no idea what you're saying. They did. And see, he says, I will give them a white stone, in the stone a new name written, which no man knoweth, saving he that receiveth it. Let me put it like this. You serve an amazing, good, great, wonderful God. God created you. God loves you. God only has good for you. You've got to understand God has good for you. And he reaches over there, them that are living in those temples and bowing to statues and, and having relationships with people of the Moabites that would never satisfy. It's never going to quench. Marriages like that would never work. Never, ever, ever. I don't care what lust is in your mind or what feelings come over you. It won't work. And God stands on the other side and says, I'll give you something. He says, I want to give you manna. Do you know what manna was? It was something that they got in the Old Testament. It was something that God provided for them that well, nobody else could. When they were starving, when they were empty, and they were in need, God said, I will give you something from heaven, and I'll give it to you something that will satisfy you every single day. It will meet the need. It will fill your life. And I'll tell you, that's why we have to stand there and live out the gospel, because I have something that satisfies. I have something that works. It will work in your marriage. It will work in your relationship. It will work in your home. It will work in your job. It works. And God says, I'm the only one that can give it. Manna was nothing that man made. It was something that God man made. And it said the secret manna. Literally, the world didn't understand it. The world didn't have it. It was something that came from God. You'll never regret living pure for God. You'll never regret living right in your marriage. You'll never regret serving God in your life. You'll never regret putting God first. Never regret it. It's something that God does. It's something that God blesses. And it only comes from God. 
He says, I'll give you a white stone. The stone was symbolic of even the day and age in which they lived. When they would win or they would fight in or they would do the Olympic Games and all that stuff, the winner would get a stone. It represented the, the, the treasure. That was the thing that would allow them walk on the stage to be able to get their award. It was a white stone because they didn't have the things that we have today. God says, I'll give you something. And he made it specific. It's a white stone. It's a stone of purity, a reward of purity. But on it was a name that's a new name. That's something that we only find in Scripture many times of Jacob, when he was no longer Jacob but changed to Israel, and Saul was no longer Saul, he was changed to Paul. God said, I know what you dealt with, and I know the past, and I know you dabbled in sin, and I know you flirted with that, and I know you bowed down to the gods, and I know you thought that would work, and it doesn't, but if you pull yourself out of that, I promise you, I'll make it new, I'll make it different. I'll give you a new name. You won't be known as that girl. You won't be known as that guy. You won't be known from your past. I'll give you a new name. See, that's light. It's not perfection. It's not that you lived a life of, oh, I've never sinned or never fell in. It's a matter of you realize that God is better than anything of the garbage that the world has to offer. You see, compromises one step at a time. One decision at a time. You're dating that girl. We're going to serve God. We're going to do what's right. But hey, that one date. I, I want my marriage to work, but I'm just talking to that girl online right now because she listens to me and I need somebody. I know it is right, but I'll tell you what. I, I, I need something to calm me down after work. And I, I need something that's going to... It will never satisfy and will never leave you there. It will never just go away. Because Satan's goal from the very beginning was to destroy you, to weaken you, to ruin you. And we see that all over. I see that on Facebook, and I see that on the news, and I see it in the streets, and I see it all around us. And I'm thinking, Christians, we cannot compromise. We can't. I say that for your own sake, and I say it for the sake of our, our, our generation. You cannot compromise. So with heads bowed and eyes closed right now, I say that even to those that are watching online. It doesn't matter where you're at. You don't have to be in a church for God to work with your heart. But I'm just asking you, check your heart right now. Is there an area of your life that you're just taking one step in the wrong direction? You say, man, I know this is wrong, but I've justified it. I know this isn't right, but it just felt right at the time. Call it out right now in your heart and mind. God, this is my compromise. God, this is what I've been doing. And make it right. God said, I hate it. I hate it. You know what you do when your father tells you there's something in your life that you hate it? You said, then God, I'll get it out. God, I'm not going to keep it. God, I'll make it right. And I want you to understand that God promised at the end of it. He said, I'll give you manna. I'll give you that reward. I'll change who you are. I promise you, you'll never find that in the world anywhere. So with heads bowed and eyes closed right now, I challenge you, even those that are watching online, man, if, you're, if your life is not right with God, or maybe you don't even know what that means, it starts simply with having a relationship with Jesus Christ. It doesn't start with getting to this building. You can, some people can't even get to this building right now. Jesus will meet you where you're at, on your couch, in your car, in the parking lot. Right now, he'll meet you where you're at. Just acknowledge that you're a sinner, that you know that you need Jesus Christ, and you ask him to come into your life and to set you free. He's the only one that can. If we confess our sins. We ask him to forgive us. We ask him to come into our life. We ask him to set us free. I promise you that is what salvation is, because he died to set you free. You pray that from your heart, and I promise you that will be a change from the inside out and a peace and a satisfaction that nothing else can bring you in this world. But I challenge every Christian right now, dear church, please don't compromise.